This is problem 643E, it's on page 274. An iron block of unknown mass at 185 degrees Fahrenheit is dropped into an insulated tank that contains 0.8 cubic feet of water at 70 degrees Fahrenheit. At the same time, a paddle wheel driven by, 200, or by a 200 watt motor is activated to stir the water. Thermal equilibrium is established after 10 minutes with a final temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit. Determine the mass of the iron block and the entropy generated during this process. All right, let's sketch the system so we can understand what's going on here. Uh, we've got a system that has an iron block that's been dropped into it. The iron block is at 185 degrees Fahrenheit, which by the way is 645 Rankine. So here's our, our iron block that's been dropped into the water. So let me indicate the water with a blue marker. Now the volume of the water is 0.8 cubic feet, and of course it's water, it's H2O. And its temperature is at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, which by the way is 530 Rankine. The other thing that happens is that uh, a paddle wheel stirs the water probably to aid in um, uh, causing the iron and the water to reach equilibrium. And the power input rate in the form of work is 200 watts. Okay, so that's what we know about it. Now, 10 minutes elapses. Before thermal equilibrium is reached, so there's our process. So that we move from state one here to state two, where the water, well, let's, let's do the iron first. The iron is at 75 degrees Fahrenheit and the water is at the same temperature. They're both in thermal equilibrium. Uh, 75, sorry. Now that temperature of 75 degrees Fahrenheit is the same thing as 535 Rankine. Does this make sense? Which body lost energy? Iron. 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 Which body gained energy? Water. Water, okay. Now the first question is how much mass of iron is there? Well, if you think about it, if you know the heat capacity of the iron and the heat capacity of the water, and you know the temperature change of the iron, then you could figure out exactly how much energy the iron lost, right? And on the other hand, if you know the mass of the water, which you can get because you know the volume of the water, and you can assume some reasonable density or look it up at 70 degrees Fahrenheit, well, then you could figure out, well, all the, the energy lost by the iron was gained by the water, plus the water gained some energy due to this, this power flow, right? So what we've kind of danced around here is an energy balance. We could use an energy balance to figure out, ultimately, the mass of the iron. But let's set up the energy balance to begin with. So here's our solution. We're going to start off by trying to find the mass of the iron, and we'll just write our general energy balance, right? Q minus W equals delta U. Now we have to decide what system to take. I will take the whole thing as the system. You could take just the iron, you could take just the water. It doesn't matter, you'll get the same result. It's just you may have to write more than one energy balance. If you take the iron separate from the water, you're gonna need two energy balances. The intermediate heat transfer will end up canceling out, but you know, you could do it. I'm just gonna take both together as my system. The other thing I'm gonna do is I don't like this power flow because I wanna talk about energy, not an energy flow rate. So I'm gonna figure out how much total work flows into the system. So let's pause for a minute on the energy balance and say the total amount of work that flows in is the power flow rate multiplied by the amount of time that it flows. So 200 watts, um, yeah, that's fine, I'll write it that way, times 10 minutes. Well, those won't end up in units that I like, so I'm gonna multiply 60 seconds per one minute. Well, that way the minutes go away, but also notice a watt is a joule per second, so the seconds will go away. I'm sorry, the minutes went away, I forgot to cross it off. So I'll get joules of energy. So this is uh, 120,000 
joules, which by the way is 120 kilojoules. So now I've basically quantified how much energy flows into the system. Okay? All right. Now, how much heat flows into or out of this system? I'll give you a hint. Heat is transferred from the iron to the water. So how much heat flows? None. None. Good job. You didn't let me push you into the hole. Good job. My system boundary is here. There is no heat transfer across the system boundary. There's only heat transfer internal, but that's just a transfer of thermal energy. And that'll be taken care of in the right-hand side of this equation. So let's continue with the equation then. Zero minus, now this work in our, in our uh, uh, sign convention, is work in positive or work out positive? You can think of it this way. If you work out, it's positive. It's a good thing, okay? It's in another positive, isn't it? Because it's going into the system. Well, heat in is positive, work out is positive. Okay? That's, how, that's our sign convention. Heat in is positive, work out is positive. If you remember it, thinking of a locomotive. Okay, you put heat in essentially, and you get work out of it. Both those things are good for pushing the train down the tracks. Okay. All right, so zero anyway minus. Now this work is flowing in, so that's a negative flow. So I've got to put a negative uh, work in here. I'm not going to switch to numbers yet, even though I know this is 120 kilojoules. Okay, and we'll do that in just a minute. Now let's keep expanding this equation. Now. This change in internal energy, well, the system consists of two different pieces. I can't just lump them together because they begin at two different temperatures. So I'm going to talk about the change in the internal energy of the iron and the change in the internal energy of the water. Because okay? those two things together, the iron and the water, are the system. Right? They are the bank account together. So expanding the right-hand side some more, the mass of the iron multiplied by the heat capacity of the iron multiplied by the temperature change of the iron. Let me go ahead and expand that. We'll say the temperature change of the iron, well, the final state of the iron is at T2. The initial state of the iron is at uh, T1 of the iron because, of course, I have to use that because the iron starts at 185 degrees whereas the water starts at a different temperature, right? So there's delta U of Fe. I have to add to that delta U of the water. Well, that's the mass of the water. Let me just use a subscript W for water rather than H2O. Heat capacity of the water, T2 less temperature of the water initially. Make sense so far? Now it's, it's pretty obvious that the iron cools down. So this term, this change in energy of the iron is going to be a negative thing. The change in the energy of the water is going to be a positive thing. That makes sense because T2 here is more than this T1, whereas T2 here is less than this T1. Okay, So this makes sense. Now notice the only unknown in this equation is the mass of the iron. And so we could solve for the mass of the iron. I won't bother showing you all of the algebraic steps. They're pretty straightforward. Basically it comes out like this. Work in minus mass of water times heat capacity of water times temperature, final temperature of water less initial temperature of water divided by the heat capacity of the iron and divided by the temperature change of the iron. Okay, it's supposed to be T1 of the iron. That ratio is the mass of the iron. All I did is I solved for this unknown. Okay. Now we've got a small problem because we don't know the mass of the water, but we could come up with a density of water. Do you guys have the density of water memorized yet? 62.4 what? That's right. Now. I just noticed something. We calculated the energy input in kilojoules. Well, that's metric. We want English. So let's finish this off. There is a conversion factor. I won't bother you with the details. It's in the front of your book. This is about 113.74 BTUs. Okay. If you do the conversion, that's what it comes out to. Now I'm going to need some space. So why don't we copy down the information that we just found out. Let, let's forget about this for right now because we don't care about power input. Let's just make a note that the total amount of work that comes in is 113.74 BTUs. Okay? That way we, we, don't, we don't care about the details that it came in at a rate of 200 watts for 10 minutes. That doesn't matter anymore. That way I can erase this bit here and continue because I don't want to move off the video camera. Alright, so let's work on this part. So the mass of the iron 
will be equal to the work in which we know is 113.74 BTUs less the mass of the water. We don't have the mass of the water, we got the volume. So if we multiply the volume of water, 0.8 cubic feet, by the density you guys just mentioned, 62.4 pounds mass per cubic foot, that will give us the mass of the water. How about heat capacity of water? Do you know the heat capacity of water in English units? That's an easy one also. You're thinking of a different, I think you're thinking of metric units and something to do with air, but I'm not sure. This one's easy, it's one. It takes one BTU to raise the temperature of one pound of water by one degree Fahrenheit. So that one's an easy one to remember too. Now, so we're, we're to this point, we've got the heat capacity of water. We need the second temperature, which is 75 degrees Fahrenheit, and we need the initial temperature of the water, which is 70 degrees Fahrenheit. You notice the degrees Fahrenheit go away, the pound mass go away, the cubic feet are gone, and we just have BTUs minus BTUs. So that's a good thing. But we're not really interested in BTUs, we're interested in pounds mass of iron. So let's work with the denominator. Now the heat capacity of iron, you can look this up, it's 0 0.106. BTUs per pound mass, Rankine, and from the engine block problem we just worked, you know that's a reasonable number. I think I just used pure iron in the back of your book if I remember right. And then the temperature change of the iron, well the iron ends up, up at uh, 75 degrees just like the water, but it starts out at 185 degrees Fahrenheit. All right, now you may look at this and say, well, I think we're going to have a problem because the denominator is obviously going to be negative. I sure hope the numerator ends up negative, otherwise I'm going to have a negative mass of iron, which makes no sense. Well, it will. It'll turn out that this term is small by comparison to this term. Uh, let's see, do I have those intermediate results here? I don't. Why don't you guys grab your calculators and calculate this term. This 0 0.8 times 62.4 times 5. Let's see what you get. 318.9. 318.9. Thank you. Now that would be 318.9 BTUs, which is obviously less, than, or which is obviously more than 113.74 BTUs. So in fact, the numerator will be negative. Okay. Now what will happen? Well, let's see. The BTUs, I'll cross it off both places. We'll cross off with BTUs here, and the Rankine will cross off with degrees Fahrenheit. How is that possible? Well, this is just a change in Rankine, and this is a change in Fahrenheit, so they are the same size. Okay? And what we'll be left with is just pounds mass of iron. So when you plug all that in your calculator, you should get 11.65 pound mass of iron. So there's the mass of the iron, and we got it from an energy balance. Let me give you a hint. In Chapter 6, you will have to use an energy balance in about every problem. And then you'll have to use an entropy equation. Yes? Uh, I got 249.6. Instead of 318? Yeah. yeah. Okay, so how much is it? 249.6. Okay, thank you. Well, hopefully it all comes out to 11.65 or I did something wrong too. <laughs> got that as the denominator, not as the total answer though. Yeah. You got this as the denominator? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, well? I got 11.65 as the answer. Yeah, well, unless it ends up being one squared. Then I got 11.65. Yeah. We have two people at 11.65 yeah. now? That's what I got on the denominator, too. You got 11.65 on the denominator? Negative. Negative? Yeah. yeah. I got that as the denominator as well. Oh, yeah. Sorry. And it still works out to be your answer of 11.65 pounds per Okay, so this will be 11.65 squared then, essentially. I think so. Yeah. So it's think just it's, just a uh, numerical oddity. Yeah. No, it doesn't. It yeah. doesn't? No. Well, I don't have a calculator. Let's see. We'll find out. If 249.6 is the numerator and 11.6 is the denominator, the answer is 21.4. Well, we'll know in just a minute. So I could, I'm not above making mistakes, so let's find out. I'm going to calculate the second term first. 0.8. Multiplied by 62.4, multiplied by essentially 5. I need that negative. So I agree that it's 249.6. And the answer is 113.74. And I need to divide by, thank you all, we'll see in a minute. 
by 0.106, and I need to divide by a negative, let's see, the difference between those two being negative 110, right? Mm -hmm. So I need to divide by a negative 110. And flip the sign. Yeah, I think it's still 11.65. Yeah. The denominator may be 11.65, but this yes. numerator is basically 11.65 squared. So like I said, it's just a numerical oddity. Okay, so that was part A. Part B, the question is, um, determine the mass of the iron and the entropy generated there during this process. Well now, think with me about entropy. If heat flowed out of the iron and into the water, what does heat do? It carries what with it? Entropy, entropy that's right. So did the entropy of the iron go up or go down? Okay, what about the entropy of the water? Okay, do you think those two balanced each other out? Yes. Ah, that's the problem. You're used to energy, and energy, everything balances out. And entropy, entropy is generated out of nothing. What we're going to find out is that the entropy lost by the iron will be less than the entropy gained by the water. Then where'd it go? It's not the, where it went, it's, it was generated. It was generated from nothing. Okay. What, what happened to accounting? <laughs> that works in energy. In entropy, you get all the entropy you want for free, and you don't want it, unfortunately, but you get it anyway. Okay? So let, let's see what happens. Yeah. Entropy accounting does not work. Entropy accounting is kind of like Bernie Madoff, I guess. <laughs> all right. Anyway. So we end up in jail when it's all said and done. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> all right. So what we just said is, if any entropy is generated, it will simply be equal to the change in entropy of the water plus the change in entropy of the iron. Because, I mean, it has to be addition, right? Because you already told me the change in entropy of the iron is negative, it loses entropy. The change in entropy of the water is positive. And I claim that this term is bigger than this term. But let's find out, okay? Remember, we went through the slides, and I, I had the slides up for a moment before I turn on the calculator again. But we, we have an equation for evaluating the entropy change of a solid or a liquid. Here it is, right here. It's just that the change in entropy, we'll just write it out for the water, is the mass of the water multiplied by the heat capacity of the water times the natural logarithm, T2 over T1, right? And for the water, we don't really have the mass. We probably should have computed it, but we can use the density times volume to come up with it. So let's, let's finish it off for the water. The, the uh, 62.4 um, pound mass per cubic foot for the density, uh, 0 0.8 cubic feet for the volume. Heat capacity of water was what again? 1 BTU. Good. 1 BTU per pound mass per degree Fahrenheit, so that takes care of heat capacity. Natural logarithm, let's see, temperature two of the water was uh, 75, temperature one of the water was 70. Have I made a mistake yet? Yes, where did I make a mistake? Ranking. Ranking, or wrong keen, I guess you could say. Sorry, bad jokes. A million comedians out, out of work, and you've got to try and make jokes. Okay, so now what happens? Pounds mass go away, we'll have BTUs per Fahrenheit. Let me make that BTUs per Rankine, because when we're talking about entropy units, it's nice to have an absolute units for the temperature. It just makes more sense, okay? All right, so if you plug all this in your calculator, you should get 0.4687 BTUs per Rankine. Is that a lot of entropy change? I don't know, I don't have a feel for it. You don't either. That's okay. But we can compare that to the entropy change of the iron. So let's do the same thing for the iron. The change in entropy for the iron will be the mass of the iron, heat capacity of the iron, multiplied by the natural logarithm of the temperature change of the iron. Now be careful, the T1s here are different. I'm just not writing the subscript of iron here and water here, okay? Because notice the iron, of course, starts out at a much higher temperature than the water starts out at, okay? Anyway, bless you. The mass of the iron was 11.65 pound mass, the heat capacity of the iron was 0 0.106 uh, BTUs per pound mass per Rankine, 
And then we need the natural logarithm of the temperature ratio. For the iron, the temperature ratio would be the um, final temperature of the iron, which is 535 rain king, divided by the initial temperature of the iron, which was 645 rain king. Again, pounds of mass go away, and we'll end up with pounds of mass, or BTUs per rain king. This comes out to about negative 0.2309. BTUs per rain king. So now we can plug into the generated entropy equation to find out exactly how irreversible this is. Okay, so we put in 0 0.4687 plus a negative 0 0.2309. I'm not writing down the units there the same. And we get 0 0.2378 BTUs per rain king. That's the amount of entropy that was generated. You know what's really interesting about this number? It's a measure of the irreversibility of the process. Because think about it. If the iron had began at a higher temperature, this number would be bigger. If that number is bigger, then the entropy change of the iron, let's see, we have a bigger number here that's going to make this overall ratio smaller, right? And so we're going to get something more negative right because we're below one anyway and so this is going to be an even more negative number which is going to make a bigger difference between these two okay so the total amount of entropy generated is going to be even more okay anyway uh, you can make a similar argument about the water and say that the farther apart the temperature of the water and the iron is the more entropy that's going to be generated the more irreversible it is okay does that make sense